Well, good evening, and welcome to the Midweek Word. To not only continue with the miniseries on the Sermon on the Mount, but I want to focus on the Beatitudes. But before we get started, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together and rightly divide the word of truth. Holy Spirit, we yield to you because you are the teacher. But Father, I declare that our minds are clear and our hearts are ready to receive what the Holy Spirit is saying on this day. So we give you all praise and all glory and all honor in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. You know, last time we talked, we talked about the central theme of the Sermon on the Mount. And it can be summarized in Matthew 5 and 48, which says, Therefore, ye shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. The word perfect does not refer to a sinless or moral perfection. It means completeness, wholeness, maturity, and being all God wants us to be as believers. See, we will never attain this in life because the scripture tells us that we'll be like him when we see him. But we could, should continually be challenged so that we become greater servants and ambassadors for the kingdom of God. The Sermon on the Mount with Jesus coming out statement, showing a new way of life totally contrary to the principles, to the standards, and to the thoughts of everyday living then and even now. Jesus is showing that living a life upside down from the concept of the world standards will add much to our spiritual life for his disciples and followers. Jesus introduced a new standard of life, a life filled with blessings and a deep abiding joy. So we need to realize that much of the Sermon on the Mount was not given as an internal focus on life, but it works with the inner attitudes and focuses on the heart. If we follow up on the words of Jesus throughout scripture, we'll find out that he expressed and lived every one of these attitudes during his earthly ministry and became the perfect example on how we should live as Christians. Walking out the bad attitudes requires a very selfless standard of life and leads us to be a greater witnesses for Christ. Even the content in the epistles reflect the foundation that Jesus laid from the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. Paul, John, Peter, and all the writers carried the same message. And that message was, it is a matter of the heart. See, no amount of social reform or behavior modification will allow a person to live out the bad attitudes unless you're a child of God. See, a true believer who is supernaturally reborn and filled with the Holy Ghost seeks to please God with his actions and with his attitudes. With that being said, let's take another look at the Beatitudes. All right, I'm going to go to Matthew 5, and we read verses 1 through 12 out of New King James Version. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, as I read the scripture, did you notice a, a type of a progression? Because we start out with the poor in spirit. See, when you're poor in spirit, you have the right attitude towards sin. And then it went to mourning. Blessed are those who mourn. See, we have a profound sorrow over the state of the soul, both for the individual, which are you, and for others. Then it went to meekness. See, meekness always accompany a sense of humility. Then the hunger and the thirst. See, when we recognize the low state of the soul, it creates a longing for what is holy and for what is righteousness. Then once we get filled with, with what is holy and righteousness, then we, we have mercy. See, mercy is the understanding that only the mercy of God will save a sinful man or a sinful nation. Then we have the purity of heart, a longing that has determined that only when the hunger for, for holiness has been met, then the purity of heart can take place. 
Once we get a pure in heart, then we become the peacemakers. See, the peacemakers are a natural progression that once conversion has taken place, that others have to come to the place of righteousness with God. So we make peace with all men as possible. Then the last one, we are reviled. This is the destination that a saint will eventually reach with the world and with the devil. When the world sees our devotion to the Father and living out a step with their ungodly philosophy of life, it turns them toward ridicule, scorn, and persecution. See, this world can't stand seeing someone who is focused and dedicated to ultimate authority. But Jesus tried to prepare the disciples and also tried to prepare for us, prepare us now for this reaction. Even today, can't you see and feel the persecution on how the believer is reviled from every side? Just look at our schools and what they're trying to do, trying to make us accept what we don't, what the, what the word says is, 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 is an abomination. But we are wrong and they revile us for living up to the ultimate authority. I believe this is why Jesus immediately goes through the comparison of salt and light in Matthew 5, 12 and 13. See, you cannot be salt and you cannot be light until you begin to fulfill the Beatitudes found in verses 5, 3 through 11. See, this is spirit-empowered life that we are called. We are called to this. A spirit-empowered life we are called to lead. Tonight, I want to quickly cover the first Beatitude, which is Matthew 5 and 14. It said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall... For theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. See, the Greek word for poor is ponchos. And the strongest indicate it means to crouch or to cover as a poor beggar who is seeking for his needs to be met. And when we could get in that position where we are empty, when we empty ourselves, and then our first obstacle to this is pride. No man has ever come into or thrived in the kingdom of God who is full of pride. Every believer who is called out of the world has to withstand the test of time. It can only be done when there is a deep-seated devotion to God and the things of God. God has never responded to pride and self-exaltation of a man. See, so much is spent on trying to build up self-esteem at the, at the expense of self emptiness See, when we empty ourselves, when we empty ourselves, then we can begin to be filled with the things of God. And that becomes with the poverty of spirit. See, the poverty of spirit is the step of spiritual growth to take place in our lives. Jesus can never be the treasure until the reality settles in that we are lost without his work of salvation. With that, I want to go to 1 Peter 5, 6. I'm going to read out the New King James Version. And it reads, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. God resists the proud, but give grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. See, we have to come with humility. We have to come with poor in spirit. Let me read out of Luke 14 and 11. And this is Jesus talking, our New King James Version. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and who humbles himself will be exalted. Also in Michael 6 and 8, it says, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly, with your God. See the proud. Jesus can never be the treasure of your heart as long as you are looking at yourself. See, just think about the 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 the, the church of 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 uh, of La 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 Silla. Remember when they said that they're not either hot or cold, but lukewarm, and God will spew them out the mouth. But the last thing they said is, I am rich and increased with goods and have need for nothing. 
See, when we reach the point that we have a not, we don't have any need, no need for anything, then we're no good. We're no longer poor in spirit. What is to be poor in spirit? If you truly become poor in spirit, there's a desperation that wells up inside of you that will cause you to pursue the things God has never before. To be poor in spirit means that, that there's a humility, a contentment, a submission, and a gratitude toward God. And in return, the blessings are reconciliation, communion, and joy. Like, like I said, blessed means happy with unspeakable joy. The idea of being poor in spirit has nothing to do with money. The focus of this passage is the nature of the heart. If you've been financially blessed, then use what God has given you to extend the kingdom and enjoy the fruits of your labor and your blessings. Don't allow God's blessings to make you disdain and look down on others. Be a blessing. If we look at that Greek word, I want to go into this Greek word, but I also want to read out the Thea's lexicon exactly what, what, what it reads in, in the Thea lexicon. And it says, out of the notes. Poor in spirit means to be begging and asking alms. He is a man who adjusts to the wealth, influence, and position. Now, as respects to the spirit, let me read this. As respects to their spirit, just to the wealth and learning and intellectual culture which the schools afford, men of this class must rarely give themselves up to Christ's teaching and prove themselves fitted to lay hold to the heavenly treasure. See, the man who has this attitude towards spiritual thing is a blessed man, that we are blessed. We cannot by means save ourselves. We can only respond in obedience to the gospel and the finished work of the cross. The world celebrates self-sufficient and motivated people, but God looks for something entirely different. He's looking for those who are empty and waiting to be filled spiritually on the inside. Let's look at Isaiah 62 and 2. Again, I'm reading New King James Version. And it says, For all those things my hand is made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. In Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is nearer to those who are who have a broken heart and save such to have a contrite spirit, contrite spirit. In Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. See, we, we, not, we must not mistake this for out for 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 passivity or apathy. We are we at the children of God are marked with a brokenness and a passion for things of the spirit. Even in Matthew, it said, let's read this again. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the beggars. Because when we're poor in spirit, we are beggars. You are greatly blessed when you finally let down and know that nothing you when you when you when you know there's nothing but God. When you finally let everything go and know it's nothing but God. See, you remember the, in Luke 18 when he talked about the Pharisees and the publican? See, when the Pharisees spoke, he was very proud of his relationship with God. But his spiritual pride filled his soul, and there was no room for God. His prayer was filled with I, 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 and referred to God only once. See, when self rules, the soul sinks. Let me say that again. When self rules, the soul sinks. When ego pushes itself to the forefront, there is no room for spiritual growth. And we can learn a lesson from the Pharisees. First, beware of pride. Secondly, beware of former religion. And thirdly, beware of human strength. There's nothing we can do in our own strength. But let's take a look at the publican. When he cried, be merciful to me because I am a sinner. See, when he said that, he opened up the blessings that come to the beggars. His honesty opened the doors and the gate of blessings. He saw his sin for what it was and realized that only the mercy and the grace of God 
had the ability to save him. And he began to plead for the mercy of God by emptying his heart. In James 4 and 10, it says, humble yourself. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. See, this is a part that will bow down. We will be unable to become poor in spirit until there's a willingness to bear a cross. It's a poverty that will ultimately recognize the strength that comes through weakness. When we can finally get on track, we can accomplish great things for God and our lives become a salt, will become the salt and a blazing light for the kingdom of God. Become the, becoming empty before God takes spiritual effort. It takes effort, spiritual effort. We can't even begin to repay God for what he has accomplished in our hearts through the work of the cross. We must become totally empty for the sake for the kingdom of God. Pride, self-reliance, self-sufficiency must be replaced with humility and desire for God. Emptiness of heart remove our tendency to lean to our knowledge, but it will also puff us up. Emptiness of heart will take away the nature of the beast. And that would have what? You know, when it said that it would allow the lamb to lie with the lion. See, when we get empty of heart, that take away the, our nature, that take away the nature of the beast. Emptiness of heart is the avenue by which God can change our nature. A man can become poor in spirit when he quits looking around and making comparison with others. Immerse yourself in prayer and the word so the spiritual transformation can take place. Be more for me that we come with his word. The more for me that we become with his word and his promises, the more we can fulfill and become ambassadors for Christ. Just like Paul, we, be, we, have to, we have to become poor in spirit. We have to do it by starving the flesh. We have to strip the flesh of things that cater toward exaltation and cater toward pride and the pride in our lives. Sometimes this is the very reason for trials and affliction which make their way into our lives. Some of these situations, especially painful relationships and conflicts, bring us full circle with the realization that we utterly dependent on God to complete his work in us. How do you know if you're poor in spirit? Let me give you these quickly and then, then we'll end. There are some things you discover that without yourself in the process, the maturity take place. You know, when we remove ourselves in the process, so the maturity can take place. Number one, this is how you know that you are poor in spirit. You'll be less concerned with the focus that becomes God. You'll be less, you'll be less concerned with yourself. The focus becomes God, the church, and the needs for others. You replace others instead of seeking a blessing, you will be seeking to be a blessing. You will get lost in the wonder of Jesus Christ. His glory will overwhelm everything that you do and everything that you pursue. You will quit complaining about the situation in life. The reason is because you will soon discover that you don't deserve anything at all. In fact, the more you need, the more abundantly the Lord will provide. You will spend more time in prayer and studying the word. You will praise and thank God for his grace and his mercies. There will be an overwhelming sense of gratitude. Remember, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I hope this word helped you tonight. Remember, empty yourselves, because you cannot be filled not unless you are empty. And you are blessed, you are happy that you are poor in spirit. You're happy that you are poverty in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. We cannot operate in this kingdom if we're full of pride and full of self-awareness, empty and become poor in spirit for yours and ours is the kingdom of heaven. Join us in our worship service at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning at Garfield High School in Woodbury, Virginia. If you can't attend in person, join our live stream just as you are watching now. Now, and also on Facebook. Remember, God loves you. And remain favored and remain favored. God bless you.